Yes, please be seated, get comfortable. If you've got a Bible, you, you might want to have it open. Um, it's always useful. But today we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, part three. And this week it's joy. Uh, obviously, we're in Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Now, just as a quick recap, here's the verse on the screen that we're looking at. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And if you've been with us over the weeks, you'll know that we started off by looking at the verse as a whole, looking at the before and the after. And we, 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 we pointed out some important things. First, the word fruit is singular. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit possesses in the nature of harmony in the way they are displayed in our lives. There's a necessity that believers have the fruit of the Spirit. And we are commanded by Scripture to have all of them present, although they may differ from person to person and time to time how prominent each one is. And also we pointed out the thing at the end there, the bit at the end that says the law of Moses finds no flaw in the fruit of the Spirit. That is why Christ fulfilled the law and thus could be the sacrifice for our sins. I also mentioned the fact that the Spirit alone can give us the ability to grow this fruit and the result satisfies all demands of the moral law in the believer's life. Last week we looked at love. And I said last week that to understand this part of the fruit and how to grow it, we must first understand how God's love is shown to us. And there were four characteristics of how God's love is shown to us that we talked about when we looked at love. And so we looked at the fact that God's love is unmerited love. None of us deserve it. Secondly, it's steadfast. Once God's love is in your life, it is there for good. It cannot be taken away. We looked at that. We also said that God's love is a suffering love. God has suffered for this love to be in your life. His son died for you. That's the suffering that we're talking about. And then I said it knows no bounds. Knows no bounds. It's endless. It sort of knows no bounds, this love that that's God, God has for us. And therefore, this is what we should be displaying in our life. And so the Bible is clear as God first loved us this way, then we must also, as those who say we love, trust, honor, obey this God, must also love as he loved. Therefore, we don't give love because someone deserves it. The truth is, if that was the truth, we wouldn't love anybody because there are most of us let people down all the time. Our love must be steadfast. Our love is a suffering love. It's going to suffer at times. It's going to be hard to love. It's going to be hard. It's going to suffer to actually be there. And it's got to know no bounds. There's no bounds to this love. So that's what we talked about. And we said, how do we do this? Well, Romans 5.5 5 puts it bluntly. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So it's from the Holy Spirit. But also we said, pursue love. It's something we have to work at. Love is not easy. It has to be worked at. And so that's what we did when we talked about love. That's where we came to the conclusions that we drew from that. Joy is the one that we're looking at today. And this one is very exciting. OK, really interesting. And I've already given Mel a strange look about something she said earlier, because we're going to go a little bit further than maybe some of you are thinking at this time from what you've already heard in the service today. But joy. Few qualities of life are more universally desired and more widely misunderstood than joy. Typically, it is viewed as a fruit of one's circumstances and as an emotional condition, a word that most 21st century people associate with a sense of well-being and happiness. Happiness. We think if we're bubbling up inside, if, if we're happy, if we've got a smile on our face, then there's joy. We've got joy. That's what joy means. And that's really, really kind of a little bit ironic. Uh, there's a little bit of irony in it. I hope it's irony. I might be using the wrong word. You never know, because sometimes they use irony wrong. Because the word happiness and its state in a human is actually a turbulent and an easy thing to achieve and keep. If the clue is actually in the word happiness. Now, did I put this up here? See, this is the definition of a very important part of the word happiness. Hap. It's a noun. It means luck, fortune. If you have the good hap to come into their houses, or it's a verb, come about by chance. What can hap to him worthy to be deemed evil? That's just a sentence that uses it. The idea behind Happiness is this idea of good fortune. I am happy because good fortune has come my way. 
I have happiness in my life because something great happened to me. I won the lottery yesterday, so now I'm happy. Mary baked me a cake, now I am happy. Sue made her Christmas cake for us, now I am happy. Good fortune. And so unhappiness is when bad things happen to you, when there's not good fortune around. And we often relate joy to that in the human sense. That's what we think it is. And yet it's a much deeper word in the Bible. And it's kind of a little bit strange that joy, something that we want to hold on to, is so fleeting. Even the words that are associated around it are fleeting. They're fleeting words in human terms. And particularly in the 21st century mindset that we have today, where we find joy in things, in people, rather than in deeper things, things that last. And, and this word is one as well. It's, it's an interesting word for the church because joy is a word that over the centuries hasn't always, at least in the world's eyes, and to be often, often to those of us inside the church, seems to be a word that is not easily applied to those who follow Christ. For many looking in from the outside of our church is the way we worship and the very manner of the people partaking in Christianity can appear quite frankly, well, the very opposite of joy-filled faith or religion. Sometimes don't we, don't we, we're a bit dour. We get quite serious, don't we? We have these modes where we become kind of like, okay, I'm at church now, serious face. I mean, five minutes before church, I could be laughing and joking with Mary and the next second, her voice goes down into her deep, holy voice that comes out. We all do it. We all do it. Even sometimes when we're reading the Bible at the front of the church, we develop this strange knack of draining the joy out of the words that we are reading rather than putting the joy in sometimes. That's what we do. And in some part, this is understandable because if you love Christ, then we take seriously the call to live in a way that is different to the word. We take seriously the idea that God is holy. We take seriously the idea that prayer is important, that the Bible's important. We do take those things very, very seriously. And so it's sometimes understandable that we, we kind of want to give it what it's worth. If we we want to give it a sense of importance. And sometimes being frivolous, frivolous doesn't do that. You know, sometimes we can over frivolize. Uh, a friend of mine at college, a, a, a lecturer in our preaching studies, once gave an, 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 an idea of this. He said he was at church and the guy was talking about joy and he decided to demonstrate joy by sliding down the banister at the front of the church. And it was quite a high banister. So it was a long way to slide down. And here was the vicar in his dog collar sliding down, just like me knocking this. And boy, did it offend half the people in the church. Because some people just found it too frivolous for such an important subject. And so, you know, maybe surprisingly, maybe surpri unsurprisingly, oh, maybe surprisingly to us as Christians, this is a word, oh, that is actually quite important in our Bible and not just for what we've already said in the service today. Now we are gonna get to that, but before we do, I wanna show you how important the word joy is. There are somewhere in the region of 150 to 200 mentions of joy within Scripture, and they are not all the same. We we'll start off in Hebrew. In Hebrew, there are 15 words for joy. Now, some of them are verbs and nouns, but that cla they class that as different words. And some of these words are really, really, really interesting. OK, I'm not going to go through each of them. You'll notice that. But the fact that they use 15 words shows us that this word joy has a richness to it, richness to it. And it also has a clarity that sort of you, you can sort of pin it down in certain places to different things. But as I said, I'm not going to go through them all, but some of these words involve instruments, leaping and jumping, inexpressible quiet joy, moving round in a circle. One of these words actually describes something like a dog chasing its tail. It's seen something exciting and it's running after it. That's how joyful it makes something. And, and it, exuberance and more. These 15 different meanings are varied 
in what they are. There are so many of them, so I'll just say a few out because of the fact that we're using the, the thingy, but Gil, Gil, Gilia, Douts, Chedver, Chedver, Mesos, Rinne, Renan, Ranan, Suze, Samak, Sinak, Sasan, Terura. Said none of those correctly. <laughs> Okay, you have to go away and learn Hebrew if you want to know. So we see instantly, this is just the Old Testament because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And so in the Old Testament, joy is there. The, new, the joy is not a New Testament creation, but also it's something that's quite varied. And we see that in the New Testament as well. There's not just one word for joy in the New Testament. And I'm going to go a little bit deeper into these ones, but we see here, First word up there is agalaliasis, which means exaltation, extreme joy, gladness. So again, three words that we would maybe associate there with joy. That would, those would be normal for us to associate joy with those things in the 21st century. Those are things, and that's found in Luke 1.14, and you can look in Luke 1.44 if you want to look up the use of that one. Then there's this one, euphrosun, which is a noun. It's used two times. And it means good cheer, joy or gladness. So again, joy in the Bible being used in a more worldly sense than maybe we thought about so far. And that's in, you can look up Acts 2.28 and Acts 14.17 for that. And then we've got this one, which is a verb. It's used 38 times and it could mean to glory, whether with reason or without, or to glory on account of, the thi of a thing or to glory in a thing. But again, it's about joyously doing this. Joy. Joy is the meaning of the word, but there's a sort of nuance to it that maybe you didn't realise. And you can see that in 1 Corinthians 121. And then we've got omni-nemai, which is a verb, which is used in one verse twice. And it means to be useful, to profit, help, to receive profit or advantage, to be helped or have joy. And I think the all have joy is actually the word it's translated to in English in our Bibles. And that's Philemon 1.20. So again, another use, a different use. But again, it, it, that's what I'm saying. The Bible uses joy for so many different things. Skirte, which is a verb used three times. To leap. To leap for joy. We all know that one, don't we? But to leap for joy. Luke 6.23. And then we've got Cairo, which is very similar to the word we're looking at today, but not totally. And this one's used 74 times. And it means to rejoice, be glad, to rejoice exceedingly, to be well, thrive. In salutations, they use it, hail. At the beginning of letters, to give one greeting or a salute. And Romans 12, 15 is a really good example of that. And like I said at the beginning, the reason I've shown you this to begin with is, is because in a moment, I'm going to talk about our word, which is the word we are commanded to have in our life. And some people's response to me talking about the word I'm going to talk about today is to think that of all the other forms of joy are not ones we should have in our life. Some people even go out of their way to avoid them because they want to have a Fruit of the Spirit, joy, rather than all the other types of joy. And what I want to say is no. The Bible's not saying that. It is saying that it is essential that the one we're going to look at today is there. But the Bible is clear. Joy is an extraordinary thing that we can experience in many different ways. And we should experience it in many different ways. But today we're going to look at the most important sense of the word joy. Kara, which is a noun, it's used 59 times. Its meaning is joy, gladness, the joy received from you, the cause or occasion of joy of persons who are one's joy. Now, that is the general overall sense of what it's used for. But when we get into the Bible, we see it's used even deeper than the actual definition that is given in, in Strong's Concordance, which is where I got this definition from. And this is the word used in our passage that we're exploring today. So what is this joy we are looking at today? And it's actually today, hopefully this will just flow for you and it'll be nice and easy. Joy 
or kara and rejoice is a feeling of inner gladness, delight or rejoicing. Joy for the Christian is marked by celebration and expectation of God's ultimate victory over the powers of sin and darkness. What a great thing to say that our, it's a feeling of inner gladness, but it's joy for the Christian is marked by celebration and expectation of God's ultimate victory over the powers of sin and darkness. And scripture does actually explain this joy in quite big depth. So it starts off with this. This joy is joy in the Holy Spirit. In Romans 14, 17, it says this, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about this a lot because we've just looked at spiritual warfare and now we've moved into the fruit of the Spirit. We're talking about the fact that our job as Christians is to walk with the Spirit. Okay, we walk, we find our righteousness, our peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not about eating and drinking. It's not about having a huge party. It's about following the Holy Spirit. And then our righteousness, peace, joy will just come naturally if we walk with the Holy Spirit every day, step by step. Each morning when we get up, we should ask the Holy Spirit to pour himself back into us, to refill us so that the leaky tank that is our heart gets refilled. So again, Scripture says this joy is joy in the Holy Spirit. This joy that we're talking about today can only be experienced in the Holy Spirit. But it's also the joy of faith. And convinced of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and joy in the faith. If you believe in the Lord, this joy is yours. You may not feel it, because like I said, this is not a feelings-based joy. This is a joy that's given. It's given through faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we see that. And that's, that brings us to the next bit as well, because this joy is the joy of the Holy Spirit. So become imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the world in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. That's 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. And the idea is, is, this is the same joy that the Holy Spirit has. So it's something we share with him. It's also joy in the Lord. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Philippians 3 verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord. We put our faith and our trust in Jesus. We trust in his death and resurrection, and it brings us this joy. And it actually says there, it is a safeguard for you. Through everything you're going through, it is a safeguard. I said to Mel the other day, I feel no joy at the moment. The truth was I was having a bad day. A couple of things had happened that had made me quite unhappy. I didn't feel any joy. Well, do you know something? I wasn't talking about this joy. I was talking about that kind of gleeful joy because God had already safeguarded this joy by the fact that it's the joy in the Lord. It comes through the faith I have in Jesus and what he's done for me, not in anything I've done. And finally, this joy is the welcome which will be addressed to faithful servants. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. This joy it's the joy we're going to feel when we stand before God's throne. And he says, well done. Good job. You kept the faith. Well done. You followed my son. When he called you, you obeyed. When the Holy Spirit filled you, you answered. You responded. Well done, faithful servant. And it talks about the fact that God is going to change us in heaven. We're going to be different. And this joy is the, is the safeguard of that. We know it's true and we know it's real. And that's the joy we have. And, and so it's a welcome which will be given to us. And so it's the joy we're talking about today. It's not a joy that you can create. It's not a joy you can make. It's not a joy you can sort of summon up by working yourself into a frenzy. 
We've all done that sometimes, haven't we? I, I've done it at a rock concert once. It was actually a praise concert and me and my two mates, Stuart Burnside and Andrew Burnside, sitting in our seats and we're having a good old praise and worship and we come from a very dour church where they don't really do that. So this was very different for us. And suddenly we've whipped ourselves up into such a great furore. We ran to the front of the church and we were boogieing away at the front, all three of us in a very, very badly uncoordinated way, which was making everybody else around us laugh. But we didn't care, because at that moment we were experiencing joy. But that's not the type of joy that we're talking about here. It's something better than that. In the secular works, joy is defined as the emotion evoked by well-being, success, good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. But actually, this is about possessing what God desires for us, what God wants for us. So it's very different. And as I said already, the world's definition of joy is virtually synonymous with the definition of happiness. For both of these emotions are dependent on what happens. In the worldly sense, that's what they believe. But to us, joy is given. Joy is given to us. It is given. It is implanted in us when the Holy Spirit is poured out into our life. And so we can see that already, that biblically, the joy we're talking about at the moment is different because it cannot be obtained by works. It can only be attained through God. So what does this mean? So we can see biblically joy has distinct characteristics which radically distinguish it from its circumstantial and emotional counterpart. What do I mean by that? Well, this, rather than being dependent upon circumstances, the Christian joy part of the fruit of the spirit, it's a condition of one's being. And you can look at Galatians 5.22 and Romans 14.17 to see that. And so basically, it's a part of you. It's a part of who you are. This joy is now who you are if you are a Christian. And the only circumstance upon which joy depends is that one's life is in Christ. Jesus promised to give joy which no one, not even any circumstance, could take away. And so Christians are joyful because they are alive in Christ. These three bits here are quite important. And it's not dependent upon circumstances. It's dependent upon Christ. But there's something really, really interesting about this word that I want to show you today. And I think it illustrates these three points really excellently. And it's this. I want you to read this phrase. Grace gives gifts, rejoicing to see the joy that results from rejoicing to receive the gifts. Now, you're probably thinking to yourselves at this point, what is this balm pot on about? Well, I'm going to show you. Here is the Greek words that are used for the words above. So the first one is grace. I spoke about this week, this last week when we we're doing communion. Charis. Gives is charizomai. Gifts is charisma. Rejoicing is kairo. Joy is chara. Rejoicing again, kara and gifts charisma. You may notice the C, the H, and the A. They all come from the same root. They are all, these words are interwined. They are words that are connected. They are not just loosely put there. These words are connected in so many ways. And when we look at our Bible and think about what this means, grace gives gifts, rejoicing to see the joy that results from rejoicing to see the gifts. You see, God gives us grace, doesn't he? And it's a gift. And he gives it rejoicing. Do you know why he gives it rejoicing? He gives it rejoicing to see the joy that results from rejoicing to receive the gifts. It's a pretty, pretty amazing way to look at it. See, our joy comes through grace and it's given by God and it is a gift that he gives 
rejoicing. He is so glad that you have accepted this gift. So glad to see it. And why is he glad? Because when you receive grace, your life changes. And I've seen so many people who have been saved and when they are saved, they rejoice. They rejoice. They are, they, they, yes, they are happy. They emotionally rejoice as well as they rejoice. Their entire demeanor changes from the inside out through this gift that he's given us. And so when we look at how connected these words all are, we can see what a great word this word joy actually is, because this word joy is connected to grace. It's connected to a gift given, and it's connected to God's rejoicing over the grace he is given. And that is pretty awesome. But to put it this way, grace is the voluntary desire to cause joy in another by means of gifts. Giving gifts is the natural tool of grace, and joy is the natural response felt when accepting gifts given through grace. Isn't that the truth? When you get a gift that you don't deserve, doesn't it bring you joy? It does. Well, I hope it does. I've been given many gifts in my life. I'm going to be honest. Every single one of them has brought me joy, even in that sort of, ooh, a gift kind of way. Sometimes, yes, you open it up and inside is a pair of socks and that emotion of joy can be quickly snuffed out. But some gifts are like, wowza. But the look on the other person's face as you give them that gift, as you're given that gift, they're, they're, they're hoping you're so joyous, aren't they? They're hoping. You just want them to go, yay! Because there's nothing worse than someone who receives a gift off you and you go, ugh, ugh. It's a voluntary desire to join another by means of gifts. And so when we look at this word kara, we can see how interconnected it is. The entire gospel message is contained in just those five words that are interwined and interconnected with each other that show us that the joy that we're talking about here is found only in God and it is a gift. You can do nothing to earn it and you cannot produce it yourself without God's help. Therefore, it is independent of circumstances. It is independent of what happens to you today. You can walk out of here today, get hit on the head by a plank of wood. Yes, it'll make you feel unhappy, but the joy of the Lord cannot be taken from you. You can think it's not there, but it's there. God wants to say to you, even as you get hit on the head by that plank of wood, I am with you, my child. My gift of grace will never leave you, no matter what you go through. We prayed for the persecuted church earlier. And I'll tell you something, I've often seen more joy from persecuted Christians than I do from Christians who have a comfortable life. You see, persecuted Christians know that what God has done for them has not been taken away and never can. There is nothing that can take away that. And so because of that, because of the independence of Christian joy from circumstances, Christians are commanded to rejoice in all things. And we could be specific about this. Mary, your rock cakes are burnt to a crisp, but God commands you to rejoice in it. Corrie ten Boone was, by her Bible, she was told to rejoice in the fleas that were in the bedding in the camp. She soon discovered why they were a blessing, because it kept the guards away, so they could have their Bible studies and prayer meetings in peace. We are commanded to rejoice in all things, no matter what. And there are various verses up there you can look up. Luke 10, 20, John 14, 28, and John 15, 11, and James 1, 2, and 1 Peter 1, 6. And also this, this capacity to rejoice even in suffering and in weakness is the result of the Spirit's continued reassurance to believers of God's love for them in Christ and their assured hope that God can use even difficulties and suffering for the furtherance of his purposes. And this is true. There's not one of us here who probably hasn't suffered in our life. The fact that you are holding on and that Christ 
continues to work in your life should reassure you about God's love and the fact that it is eternal for you. It's an eternal love that will never give up. Like I said, it goes beyond anything. It's beyond all measure. And that's really important to get our heads around because Christian joy does not isolate those of us whose lives appear to be running smoothly from those who are having a really rough time. It holds place for tears and enables compassionate participation in others' pain. Isn't that true? You see, the idea of this is quite a simple one. You see, when lives are running smoothly, it's easy to have a smile on your face. It's easy. And when things are going really, really badly, sometimes it's really hard to have people around you who are all smiley. But if you realise that your joy is not found in that smile or in the tears, it's found in Christ, then the idea is you can wrap your hands around each other and you can say, look, I've been through hard times as well. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Let me help you out. Let me be your friend. Because this spirit of joy comes from the same spirit and it's the same spirit that gives me the love. The love we talked about. I want to suffer with you through what you're going through at this time. I want the Lord's joy to be complete in you by me showing my love for you in everything that's going on in your life. And that's what we're talking about here. Sharing Christ's compassionate life, the believer is free to expend God's comfort to those who are suffering. And in so doing, Christians manifest the first fruits of the future joy when God will dwell among his people and wipe away every tear and remove all mourning, crying and pain. This is why we're told not to stop meeting together, not to give up meeting together as Christians, to make sure you find time to spend time with other people who are believers. Because by doing so, we get time to put our arms around each other. We get time to encourage each other. We get time to say, God is in your life. Don't worry, God is with you. He will come through in this life or the next. God is coming through for us in every single way. And, we, and, and that's really what it's gonna be like in the kingdom. It's gonna be no more tears, no more mourning, crying and pain. Our joy will be complete, it will be total. And it will be looking at God and saying, man, it's so good to be here. And so the joy I'm talking about today is different to the many other types of joy we can experience. It's a calm assurance that Christ is in your life and that he is working in you. Let me end with this. A, a poet wrote this. They said, where is joy to be found? Well, not in unbelief. Voltaire was an infidel of the most pronounced type. He wrote, I wish I had never been born. He didn't have that joy that we've got. Not in pleasure. Lord Byron lived a life of pleasure, if anyone did. He wrote, the worm, the canker, and grief are mine alone. He had every pleasure under the sun, but still felt like a worm. He didn't have our joy. Not in money. Jay Gould, the American millionaire, had plenty of that. When dying, he said, I suppose I am the most miserable man on earth. They always say, if you want to find a miserable man, find a rich man. It's true. Money will only make you happy to a certain extent. After a while, it becomes boring. Then you end up just buying yacht and then you buy a bigger yacht and then you buy a bigger yacht. As my brother-in-law was telling me at Christmas, he works on the really, really big super yachts. And by the time they built the big, next big super yacht, they're being asked to build the next big one because they're not happy with the previous one. Yeah, so you're not gonna find it in money. That's not how you're gonna find this joy. Not in position and fame. Lord Beaconsfield enjoyed more than his share of both. He wrote, youth is a mistake, manhold a struggle, old age a regret. What a cynical way to talk about life. Youth is a mistake, manhood a struggle, old age a regret. Wow, what a great life he had. This joy we're talking about is not found there. See, my youth wasn't a mistake, I was saved. 
My manhood hasn't been as big a struggle as I'd like it to have been so I could moan about it some more, because we love moaning, let's face it, misery loves company, but it hasn't been that terrible. And old age, I'm looking forward to it after looking at some of you guys here, especially Sue, who seems to sort of, sort of, she's the most joyful person I know, and, and I know an awful lot about her that shouldn't make her joyful. She shouldn't be as joyful as she is. But if I can be as joyful because of what Christ has done in my life as Sue is, that would be great. And it's not in military glory. Alexander the Great conquered the known world in his day. Having done so, he wept at his tent because he said, there are no more worlds to conquer. Wow. Do you know, I have no more worlds to conquer and it doesn't bother me one little bit. I've been told all my life, when are you going to get the job that brings you fame, glory and esteem? I had a really large youth group and someone still came up to me and said these words. When are you going to get a proper job, Tony? We were incredibly successful as a youth group at the time, but still people were saying, when are you going to get a proper job? One where you're going to be respected. I was like, I already feel respect because my Lord is the one guiding every step of my way. That's the security we get through our faith. And by the way, it doesn't hurt me what he said. I look back on it and laugh. And I look back on anybody saying that to me and laugh. Because quite often the mighty end up like this. So where then is real joy found? The answer is simple. Thanks to our Father's plan, it's in Christ through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. That's where real joy is found. That quiet contentedness at the end of a day, that all is well with my soul. Everything else can be up, up in the air, but my soul is well because of the Lord. And I felt this joy, this quiet, overwhelming joy in incredibly strange places in my own life. When my own brother died, some of you are going to be, find this quite a strange thing for me to say, but I found this joy that is beyond all understanding, even at that time. There was a quiet calmness about me, even as the world was raging around me. There was a quiet calmness and it came from God and God alone. And that is what this joy is. Seek this joy, seek it, it's already there. Look at what Christ has done for you. Look at what the Father has done for you and look what the Holy Spirit is doing daily in your life through his power. And you will find this joy, this quiet joy that goes beyond all understanding. That's all I'm gonna to say today. I'm gonna to hand back to Mel and she's gonna close us up.